You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for January 4th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where Drift Glass keeps getting sucked back into Chicago politics, it's the professional left with Drip Glass and Blue Gal. So we talk about our sponsors for the holy crap. 2018 was a great year for our principal sponsor, which everyone knows is where the good Lord split you, emergency farewell party supplies. Uh, we have a lot of sponsors, but this one really stood out this year. So whether you're a government employee who's been put out of work because Donald Trump is a weak man with a tiny penis, or you're Trey Gowdy, who slept on a sewer grate for a week in the same baggy 90s suit before being drummed out of office forever, or the good Lord Splitcher has a farewell sheet cake for every occasion. This week's special offers are McCarthy Tarts. They're bitter, and they're hard to swallow. That's very good, McCarthy Tarts. I like those, Thank except he's not going much. anywhere. I know, but it's it's... It's bitter and hard to swallow. So that's it's, good. He is yeah. bitter. He's yeah. very bitter. And swallow it, Kevin. Swallow it. Swallow it every yeah. day, Kevin. Yeah, gonna, every gonna look up and day. see that that Pelosi lady staring down at you, just smiling. And what smile. have you got on your side but Liz Cheney? Yeah, Liz Cheney. Oh, yeah. I'm very angry. I'm, now, nobody go see Vice, okay? It's a bad movie. It's a bad <laughs> man. Bad, bad movie. Hey, we're screening it. Nancy Pelosi is going to be screening Vice in the... Uh, House, whatever. I think screen she is the room. house. Well, she's going to yeah. have it on her phone and have everybody gather around to watch it. Yeah. Oh, let's let's watch this part again. Yes, the yeah. part where she betrays her sister. Yeah, that's yeah. great. That's it's a, it's great. just a fucking awful family, and of course they're still in in politics. So yeah, uh, Chicago. Uh, my former residence. I'm still a man of Chicago. I believe. I still believe myself. Oh, to be. you are. My dad says uh, you are. Oh well, then there you go. Yeah. Um. Uh, keeps jumping into my timeline. It jumped into my timeline for two reasons. Apparently, Eddie Burke, uh, not apparently, Eddie Burke, the corrupt alderman who's been an alderman for half a century, uh, the last of the old daily machine politicians who has been, as I described it today, like a mountain troll at City Hall for half a century, just <laughs> mining gold out of city government as corrupt as the day is long, uh, has been charged with extortion. Um, he, they, they, uh, and let's be clear, so this is the guy, the FBI raided his office yes. and put brown paper up over the windows, yes. like in early December. Yes. And then they raided it again. A man so corrupt, they raided him twice. They raided him yep. twice, like, you know, which tells you they had, and they. I bet they had a second warrant, too. I'll just oh, bet you. Yeah, yeah. Because I think they, they have, like, phone and text. He was trying to squeeze... A McDonald's, I believe. No, Might have been a Burger, Burger King. King. Burger King. Burger King. Burger right. King. Yeah. Uh, the, the one that was involved in the Laquan McDonald shooting, as a matter of fact, um, squeezed them for money that he was then going to uh, dump into the campaign coffers of Tony Preckwinkle. Now, Tony Preckwinkle is, I believe, uninvolved in this completely. This is just how Ed Burke goes about raising money uh, by extorting it from people. But Gosh. he has been just as corrupt as the day is long. And this reminds me of a story, Blue Gal. Yeah. Uh, back in the day when I was uh, 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 worked with city government in the city of Chicago, uh, back when there was a thing called the hired truck scandal, which is where a bunch of uh, mobbed up people were fake leasing trucks to the city. And a whole bunch of people went to jail and lost their jobs over it. Mm -hmm. But the prosecutor involved, uh, the FBI people involved, the, the folks who were uh, – Go, charged with getting in there, rooting it out. Because Richie Daly, this this was the one that hit really close to him. These were his people mm -hmm. who were going to go to jail. So he was desperate to keep himself out of trouble. So he put a special prosecutor in charge and stepped out of the way. And during the process of doing the squeezing of witnesses, uh, the standard thing was, and by the way, is there anything else we need to know? Because if you've withheld anything from us, you're going to go to jail if we find out what it was. And I believe it was the water department. And the, the water department people said, well, you know about the heroin ring, right? <laughs> and they said, what? what? Oh, yeah, they're, we're selling heroin out of the water department. And that sounds like this. This sounds like Ed Burke was also Donald Trump's tax attorney. Right. And they started rolling out warrants to basically 
sweep in everybody involved in, in this corrupt scumbags criminal enterprise, and Ed Burke's one of them. And it sounds like I have no special inside knowledge, but it sure looks like it's like, oh, look what we found. We're looking on your phones and we find this extortion. So now they have him for extortion. And I, I imagine now that it looks like this 75-year-old deeply corrupt racist scumbag who should have been gone from government decades ago. But he kept getting reelected. Sure, of course he did. Because you know, he had money and machine and power. And there are people in Chicago who are totally comfortable with that. So, And we're stone cold. Believe me, the stone cold racist assholes in Chicago. There are plenty of them. Uh, I know where they live. I've been to their neighborhoods. It's 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 just like you would imagine. Archie Bunker, little Archie Bunker houses next to each other with a bunch of you know white ethnic people who were terrified of the brown folks. Um, but Ed Burke has been part of that for decades and decades. So he's seventy five years old, and he's probably going to go to jail unless he you know flips like mad. So well, isn't his wife a federal judge too, or some sort of judge? Yeah, yeah. it's. it's 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 bad. It's it's you know Chicago. I recommend to anyone who wants to understand Chicago politics read Boss. Yeah. There's a bunch of good books, but read Boss by mm -hmm. Mike Royko just for the yeah. names. Just to know that. Wait a minute, isn't this family still in charge of this? And isn't this family still alderman? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. It's all dynastic politics. So everybody's got a brother-in-law or a sister-in-law or a wife or a cousin who's also in government somewhere. And once you start hauling that out by the roots, all kinds of weird shit come falling out. So uh, that's the first thing. That's the first thing that, that jumped into my timeline. And then there was um, David Axelrod. And this segues perfectly into what I want to talk about. I want to do the motherfucker yes. story next. Well, you do that, and then we'll have David Axelrod's response. But David Axelrod is a part of that story, and he's also a Chicago. Yeah, well, not anymore. Uh, you know, we, we uh, revoked his Chicago card. David, ah. David Axelrod was involved in sort of bare knuckles Chicago politics long time ago i think he was part of the harold washington campaign uh mm -hmm. he's been in it for a long time he lost a lot of campaigns but he knows how dirty it is and one of his you know oldest sort of friends and and a person who was he was this gentleman's confidant was Rahm Emanuel, and yeah. and uh axelrod presided over having Rahm Emanuel uh lifted and appointed to the chief of staff uh, Barack Obama's first chief of staff over the objections of a whole bunch of liberals was Rahm Emanuel and Rahm Emanuel is famous for swearing constantly uh, Barack Obama even made the joke about when when uh, Rahm Emanuel lost his middle finger and I think a slicing accident in a deli I'm not sure but I think that's true mm -hmm. he lost half his vocabulary uh, because flipping people off is what Rahm Emanuel did Emanuel would just fuck you fuck this I'll fucking kill you I'll gut you like a fucking fish and well, that's yeah. David Axelrod's guy, who, and that was the right. chief of staff of the United States. Suddenly, David Axelrod is a Beltway inside player who is writing articles about how uh, what a, a deep public intellectual David Brooks is and getting all of the people inside the Beltway, regardless of party, to contribute to his, I'm sure, perfectly worthwhile charity. And now he's suddenly become the Beltway guy. He's become the fragile little snowflake who who can't bear the thought of someone swearing in public. And that segues directly over to you, my dear. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, to bring up this whole thing about Rashida. I want to say her name right. I hope I can say it right. Rashida Tlaib. I believe that's how she says it. Because this, this has been trending all morning on Twitter. We're recording on Friday that she said impeach the motherfucker. Okay. First of all, who's she referring to? By the way, I'm not sure. Most, most of he's referring to Donald Trump. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, most of our listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with Dan Savage and his podcast, and how he has had for a long time. Uh, and when I say a long time, I mean the entirety of the Trump administration. I T M F A, impeach the motherfucker already. Yes, and he has it on buttons. He has it on bumper stickers, T-shirts, what have you, and. So the congresswoman was, I'm sure, referring in part to that. Uh, if not, she was simply calling Donald Trump a motherfucker because he is one. So, one. Yeah. Uh, she didn't really have a problem saying that. And she is doing everything right today. Yes. Yes, she is. Uh, she has something that Donald Trump doesn't have. <laughs> she has a staff. Yeah. And she has a staff that works for her. And is on. They're, they are professional and they are on this. And mm -hmm. they released a statement. Her press person, 
who is a professional press person in her office that is already set up to handle, you know, questions and uh, referrals from the media, gave a two paragraph statement. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it reiterated that Donald Trump needs to be removed from office. That is her position as a congresswoman. Yes. That he is unfit to be president. And now and that's to be impeached. And now that's the and, conversation. Let's and and they they clearly said she was elected to shake up Washington, not to continue the status quo. She wants him impeached. She thinks he needs to be removed from office. She thinks he's unqualified and unfit for the office of president of the United States. Yes. And Donald Trump can't fight that no. because he doesn't have a staff. He doesn't have a staff to tell him to remove the toilet paper from his shoe. Mm -hmm. And so he is operating at a disadvantage to all of these women who have competency behind them, yes. including Nancy Pelosi. Now, the motherfucker comment got everybody's attention this morning, and I hope you noticed that David Gregory was wringing his hands about oh, this. Every, everyone was. Sad. Jonathan Chait said this is just a gift to Donald Trump. Really? Oh, Really? Okay. But it's all the same type of person. Yes. It's all the right. same delicate, beltway, hothouse flower who, right. who has no pro – I'm sure has no problem once the cameras are off swearing and behaving abominably right. but we have right. to pretend that it's it's victorian england well and the reason we have to pretend it's victorian england with liberals and not with republicans is really important there we go republicans saying fuck your feelings and a t-shirt and grab them by the pussy and everything else does not threaten anybody's big bank no. stocks right, right. <laughs> it when when liberal women get angry, when liberals get angry, when progressives get angry enough to start pushing a populist message that actually means something to people's lives, mm -hmm. uh, this is why it's very important that Elizabeth Warren announced this <laughs> my, this week. I am not endorsing Elizabeth Warren, but her message that middle class people have been screwed by the big banks is really consistent it is and over years and years and years she has been saying this in fact when i heard her her interview with rachel maddow i was kind of bored i was like oh my gosh she's saying everything she said in every interview with rachel maddow all along but it's consistency if that campaign and again i'm not endorsing any candidate at this point but if that campaign gets the motherfucker uh -huh. anger behind it, that's a real threat to David Gregory's bank stocks. And you have said for years that there's this cooling agent there to Republican is. anger mm -hmm. that's David Brooks and the the cooling tank that makes it all acceptable in Beltway Chardonnay parties where everybody knows that, oh, yeah, re Republicans get angry about abortion and they get angry about black people and they get angry about uh, illegals, et cetera, et cetera. And that gets us votes, and then we come to Washington and we serve the military-industrial complex and the big banks. Ha, ha, right. ha, ha, ha. That's the game, and everyone That's knows it. That's the game. Mm -hmm. Liberal anger, women's anger, progressive anger leads to huge changes in the way the, the Beltway and their financial mm -hmm. support system operates. And that's why they have to wring their hands and clutch their pearls and freak well, this out. Is not, this is nothing new. Liberal this anger. is nothing new. They, that if if yeah. you are a veteran of you know, an old school blogger. If you were around in the 2000s, mm -hmm. uh, back in the aughts during the Bush administration, when you could open a blog and run it successfully by just publishing fuck Bush every day. Yep. We had long, thoughtful, liberal disquisitions on the use of the word fuck, whether to spell it yep, in did. the Chaucerian, P-H-U-Q-U-E, to fool editors. We, we, we thought of all kinds of clever things to do. But the point was, we had already been cast out of polite society for having opinions that turned out to be 100% correct right. and 100% anathema to the party line of the Republicans who owned and operated Washington. And that was everybody from Rush Limbaugh uh, to David Brooks, who was writing slanderous liberal hit pieces in the now uh, departed and not dearly departed Weekly Standard. There was a, a concerted effort mm -hmm. uh, on, on across the right that liberal, fuzzy-headed, um, Norman Lear-loving, uh, Birkenstock-wearing, pinko, hippie douchebags like you and me 
uh, were the problem. That George Bush is a military genius. The, the mm-hmm. Iraq War was over. Uh, David Brooks pronounced it over two months after the invasion uh, began, and it was a uh, uh, fait accompli. Everything's been proven right. We've been proven right. You're all wrong. And the fact that that was coming apart at the seams, even as they were writing it, led to them devoting, and I'm, by them I mean the entire Beltway media, everyone in the Beltway media, um, devoting an enormous mm-hmm. amount of energy to lying about it. To pretending everything was fine, to pretending everything was okay, that there's just this fringe bunch of lefties out there screaming their heads off. Who knows what they want? Who knows what they say? And we said, well, look, you already hate us. We're never going to get on Meet the Press. We're never going to get on Face the Nation. No one's ever going to take us seriously outside of a few slivers on cable news. Um, so we're just going to yell as loud as we possibly can for history. For history's sake, we're going to start using the word fuck a lot. We're going to start using uh, language that you find offensive because we find your behavior offensive. We're doing it on purpose. We're doing it in the same way George Carlin did, very carefully, in a very strategic way to make sure you understand and to brand ourselves as outsiders because you've already put us outside. Might as well lean into it. That has never changed in the entire history of blogging, going back now uh, 14 years for me, 15 years, I think, coming up for you. Um, longer for others, uh, and the entire history of sort of liberal outsiderism, this has never changed. Liberals have been screaming their heads off right. about something horrible going on inside the corridors of power. They've been ignored. Four to five years later, it turns out they were right. And the same assholes who created the problem then become the new commentators on how everybody got it wrong, Blue Gal. Isn't it a shame that everyone got it wrong? Right, and the right. only thing that cuts through the bullshit, the only thing that gets their attention is slapping it upside the head with a dirty word occasionally. And I'm glad she did. I, you know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm. Oh, I'm absolutely glad she did. And as I said, I think mm-hmm. the way she has handled it today to stick to her guns and get back to the issue at hand, which is Donald Trump's yep. unfitness for office. As you continue to do that, all of a sudden we have to have that conversation. And I, I want to applaud Nancy Pelosi. I don't always applaud Nancy Pelosi, but her statement about the wall yesterday was remarkable in that she said, it's not a wall between Mexico and the United States. It's a wall between reality and his constituents. And all of a sudden we're talking Mm -hmm. about voters. We're talking about Donald Trump voters who are being walled off from reality by Fox news, by Trump, by whatever media voice out there is walling them off from a reality that there is not going to be a wall, that their Medicare and Social Security are being cut, that their uh, environment, the air they breathe Mm -hmm. is being ruined. And I'm using that word very, very consciously. Uh, She gets it. She gets that this wall is immoral and she's willing to say so. And I'm very proud of her. The reality hasn't changed. These people have lived Uh, behind, you know, a wall sealed inside of uh, what I used to call – the yeah. Rush Limbaugh beer fart right. rebreathing like bell jar um, for, for decades. They don't. They, and yes, and the right, problem right. is not um, mm-hmm. that. The problem is that reality is so persistent. Um, I think the Romans used to have a saying about you can drive the, the mm-hmm. jungle out with a pitchfork, but it'll always come back. You can drive reality away for a while. You can just scream right. so fucking loud and, and elect a complete racist criminal lunatic to bellow on your behalf. And you can keep reality and causality and cause and effect at bay for a while. You can toss a ball high enough in the air that it'll take a while to come back down, but it's always going to come back down. And that's what the right can't abide, the fact that they can't hide from reality much longer. So they need a bigger, thicker, louder, dumber, more racist wall um, to, to basically be tuck pointed into place every few days. To keep reality out, because reality just keeps cresting over the top of whatever they're lying about today and making them look stupid. Uh, I I wanted to bring up Ben Rhodes because he pointed something out. This is not something I read to you earlier, but it's it's a more recent tweet talking about Donald Trump deciding that he's going to go to the briefing room yesterday. Right. And interrupt coverage of Nancy Pelosi with a bunch of bald guys that he saw on Fox, by the way. I don't know if you know that all of those... They're yeah. part of the uh, Border Patrol Union. They're not necessarily active Border Patrol agents. But uh, Steve M., who writes for No More Mr. Nice blog, he pointed out that everybody behind Donald Trump in that 
briefing room had been on Fox, and that's where he'd found them. Because that's the only place he can find anybody for talent, you know? Send over the skinheads. I want to see the skinheads behind me. I'm going to do a thing. I'm going to need three skinheads behind me. Yeah, right. So there they are. And there he wrote down their names or had someone write down their names and get them over to the White House because they'll come. So Ben Rhodes pointed out that leadership is not about being able to command the attention of cable news for an hour. And that's what Donald Trump thinks leadership is. Yeah, that's all I can do. He did it today in the Rose Garden. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can get the TV cameras on me, I win. Right. And that is catching up with Donald Trump. Well, it reminds me of... of the, the episode of The Simpsons where Homer's mom returns, and uh -huh. and Homer and and uh, uh, Mona Simpson and and she and Lisa hit it off, and while they're discussing, I think a separate piece, you know, yeah. <laughs> on the porch, um, Homer is doing handstands on the sidewalk, going, "Mom, mom, look at me, look at me, mom." She goes, "Yes, Homer, you're very smart. That's great. Look at me, mom. Look at me." That's all Donald Trump does. He mm -hmm. jumps up and down, waves his hand, waves his dick in the air, goes, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And what everyone does, what comes out of his mouth is pure, undiluted crazy mm -hmm. and wrong. I mean, it just the amount of shit that he's gotten completely wrong. There's just the lies he's pulled out of his ass or the straight up Soviet era propaganda he is now pimping as American foreign policy. It's also completely wrong is breathtaking. Um, the 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 uh, today. He's marching out, I believe, his Homeland Security woman, Christian Nilsson, yeah. uh, to talk about the, the, the overwhelming tide of terrorists who, who they've stopped at the border. Because as someone pointed out today, they've lost the economic argument and they've lost the cultural argument for, for his surrogate penis wall. So now they're going to pull out the terrorist card. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, there's all these terrorists. There's thousands of them just swarming at the border trying to get in the only way to keep America safe. And that's the George Bush card. Yeah. That's the when in doubt, when you're losing the election, when you're losing the conversation, raise the terror alert. Uh, and it doesn't work anymore. And no one takes them seriously anymore, which is incredibly dangerous, by the way, because in case of an actual emergency, no one's going to take a goddamn word these people say seriously. But it's so, the, the degree of desperation they have to, to keep changing the subject from Nancy Pelosi's, now the Speaker of the House, to the Mueller investigation, to the underlying criminality of the entire uh, uh, Trump administration mm -hmm. to all the people who flipped on him to all the horrendously racist awful things he says every day to all of his friends flipping on him or going to jail or pretending they don't know him uh, to his his unpopularity rating among sentient beings being at an all-time high uh, it's it's the walls really are closing in yeah. those are the walls I'm interested in the ones that are closing in on this asshole every mm -hmm. day and the only thing he it's it's truly weird it's uh, again it reminds me of um another simpsons episode <laughs> where homer gets a gun oh, yeah. and he uses it for everything right. Right. You know, shoot, he opens his beer can with a gun and, and because all donald trump knows how to do is make a giant loud braying ass of himself in public that's literally all he knows how to do so every situation that's what he does and for the 33 percent of america who are reprogrammable meatheads who've been programmed by Rush Limbaugh and, and 30 years of hate radio and Fox News to believe anything that comes out of this asshole's mouth, that's great. They think he's doing a great job. For every other person on earth, it's horrifying. And we've reached the point now where we finally have a crowbar. We finally have a, a crowbar in the House of Representatives to pry the lid off of this, to prying bricks out of the wall and forcing them to face reality. And that's why 2019 is going to be a hell of a year. Now, there is one force working against this, a force I like to call the Beltway Media. Yep. <laughs> um, this is a hat tip to 10 Grain, uh, who basically pointed out, oh, it's 2016 again. Yes. Yes. Um, we're, we're now returning to our default settings because for two years, you couldn't say both sides really. I mean, all the same people did all the time. Because that's all they know how to do. So Chuck Todd did it all the time. They had both sides on all the time. It was embarrassing. It was they, they, you could clear you could tell that people like they were embarrassed that they felt they had to do it. That their boss would fire them unless they they kept up this charade. But when Republicans control the entire government, it is ludicrous to continue pretending that this is a both sides problem, despite the fact again that they do it all the time. But now. That Nancy Pelosi has been Speaker of the House for five minutes. Now we can all go back to doing what we'd like doing, 
which is bemoaning the fact that both sides are terrible. Talking about how neither side will compromise. How about gridlock in Washington? Blah, 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 blah. So we are announcing on the professional left a bolo, if you will, a be on the lookout. We want all of our listeners to be on the lookout for, for signs of both siderisms. If you see something, say something. And when you say something, say it really loud. Make sure they hear. Because we've noticed that at least around the edges, if we are loud enough and say motherfucker enough yep. and, and shove it right in their face enough, fast enough, and humiliate them enough, eventually – some of these people get shamed into stopping at least momentarily what they're doing. Yes, they catch and themselves. That, yep. Yeah. Um, I did like Jason O. Gilbert, who writes for The Daily Show, or he's an employee mm-hmm. of The Daily Show. Uh, he had uh, a sad about what Rashida Tlaib, Tlaib said. He said, like her or not, she should not have referred to the president using the Secret Service code name for Mike Pence. <laughs> So there you go. Yay. Yay. Yes. You win the internet, sir. Um, <laughs> you want to talk about Chris Hayes, Mitt Romney, or David Brooks? Oh, good Lord. I get that choice. Yeah. these. I, I'm, this is what you call in the card business. I'm forcing the card. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm giving you three terrible choices. And no, I'm, I'm ready to not talk terrible. About. Let's start with no. Mitt Romney. Yeah. Because that's, uh, you know, that's the never Trumper there who's, who's being my- bold and uh, what is he? A maverick. That's what I. He's a maverick. What it is. Maverick. Yeah. Maverick is what brings us together today. Um, my new nick- nick- nickname for him is the Seven Percent Solution <laughs> because he is literally the hero to the seven percent of the Republican Party who aren't out and proud bigots and imbeciles and anti-science um, Bible nuts and a gun nuts and a homophobe and a xenophobe. All those people love Donald Trump, but the tiny, tiny residue left over after all those people have moved to the right the bill crystal universe of the party the david brooks universe of the party the joe scarboroughs the people who who write columns and opine publicly for lots of money about a republican party that simply does not exist and they keep trying to wish it into existence mitt romney's their guy now he's their hero and uh i wrote a nice little post called hokum's heroes i hope you'll all enjoy it uh this is just bullshit um, it, because it really does depend on doing the two things that every conservative does. Whether you are Rick Wilson or you are David Brooks or you are David Frum or you are Rush Limbaugh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Pick any card, any card in the deck. It doesn't matter. They all do the same two things. The first is they all lie about the past. They all pretend the past never happened, that nobody has access to anything that happened before 2016. So nobody can crack the code on what we're doing. Well, that's because all the people you hang out with have a mutual agreement not to mention your own filthy, inconvenient past. It doesn't mean the past doesn't exist or we don't remember. It's just that you won't allow yourself to have a conversation with anyone who might bring it up. And secondly, they all believe that if we just put a new coat of paint on the same shitty, awful, monstrous ideas that got us here in the first place, that will do the trick. And they're always wrong. Um, and it, it is fascinating to watch that wheel just keep turning and turning and never going anywhere. The same losers, the same people who are wrong all the time, the same cabal of opinion writers who never get fired, who are never right, and who are all very predictably clustering around the first person to show a whisper of opposition of any kind to Donald Trump. Mm-hmm, right. Of course, Mitt Romney will fold because that's what Mitt Romney does. Of course, they'll go along with the wall because that's what Mitt Romney does. Um, Mitt Romney, who ran one of the most dishonest presidential campaigns in memory. But, of course, they don't have a memory, so they don't remember that. And that's what's so weird to watch. that Not that this happens, that it's so goddamn predictable. Well, That you and I could have written this column, you know, two years ago, and probably did, about this is how the never-Trumpers will cluster. It really makes me question, too, Utah voters. Because Mitt Romney, of all the Republican senators, probably has the most freedom to stand up to Trump, being from Utah, where they really don't like Trump very much anyway. Jason Chaffetz. (coughs) Excuse me. I got a little something. (laughs) Lauren Hatch. I'm sorry. The congestion from the cold last week is still lingering. But you go ahead, Blue Gal. You tell me all about Utah and and their (laughs) progressive forward looking politics. You're just proving me wrong. Okay. (laughs) No, but he is. He, he would be, in theory... You're proving my point, though. 
which is it's yeah. not Trumpism, it's Republican. Exactly. Exactly. And Trump isn't Trump, he's a Republican. Is because exactly. he's a Republican, no one's going no Republican is going to say boo to him because Republicans. Yes. Right. Yeah. So you're perfect. He is the party and the party is Trump yeah. and I don't I don't know how uh, this is again I've repeated this a million times in this podcast I will continue doing so this is why liberals aren't allowed on television right. or on, on competitive radio because we keep saying shit like well Trump is the party yeah. so uh, okay I have a question for for Senator Romney what is your plan to get rid of the 93 percent of your party who think Donald Trump's a genius right what's your plan are you going to magically transform them into reasonable thoughtful adults because I've been waiting for 30 years for that to happen and it's never happened and it never will because you would lose every single fucking election without those people and you goddamn well know it so what's your plan? What's the big plan to get rid of the of the base of your own party and continue to have a party? I will hang up and wait for my answer. Yeah. And 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 then nothing will happen. They'll change the subject, they'll, you know, the shiny object will come out, they'll move on to another card trick, but that's it. That's because I don't have anything. Um and that brings us uh to Mr. David Brooks. Yes. You go ahead with that. And then I'll talk about Chris Hayes. Mr. David Brooks is back in the saddle, baby. Um he is back uh talking about he he wrote Half of a good column. You mean before he slipped the razor in the apple? Yes, as he always does. And and there were there were all these people who were just all the, on social media going, "Oh my God, David Brooks has written this great column." And I just thought, well, yeah, of course, because you read the first three paragraphs and you stopped reading, going, "Oh, maybe he's turned a corner. Maybe he's discovered some sort of inner light that will bring him back to the uh, the, the concord of humans." And and a discussion that doesn't isn't based on both sides bullshit. Oh, but you forgot to read the rest of the column. So. Uh, the first half of the column, the first third of the column is some parable about wolves and children, which is, I'm sure, delightful, and I don't, couldn't care less. The second third is about how Donald Trump is a monster who doesn't recognize or respect institutional authority. He's just a monster. Of course, 18 months ago, the same Mr. Brooks is telling, literally wrote a column about, let's not get carried away. Uh, but now he's decided to get, get carried away because liberals are right and he was wrong. Um, so he's decided that Donald Trump really is just a terrible, terrible threat. But then comes the razor in the right. apple, right? Who's to blame? Who's at fault? Who are the problems? If you go through the entire column with your search function on and look for the word Republican, you will never find it. You will not find the word GOP. You will not find the word conservative anywhere in the column. Those categories of political and ideological organization do not exist in a column written clearly about the state of the Republican Party because Mr. Brooks is a Republican. So what is his job? What is he doing here? Mr. Brooks's job is to be Mr. Wolf. His job is to come in after the Republican Party has created a giant bloody fucking mess and clean it up, not to reform it, not to make it better, but to find some way to camouflage the bloody, shitty mess they've made of the party until they can get the car to the car crusher of both siderism and eliminate the evidence. So in an entire column about the sorry state of the Republican Party, which has owned the federal government lock, stock and barrel for two years, and the monstrous person who runs it named Donald Trump that never mentions Republicans, never mentions the GOP, never mentions conservatives, who is to blame for our problems? It's the partisans, Blue Gal. Yeah, there you go. On both sides? It's the partisans. Unless they rise above, you know, put party above nation, they'll fall back to, into partisan lines. They'll hurl abuse. Their primary concern will be, how can this help me in 2020? And who should rise above this? Should the Republicans who've been enabling Donald Trump this whole fucking time step up and start behaving like grownups? No, 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 no. It's the congressional leader. Oh. And that's when you realize... Oh, it's just David Brooks being David Brooks at cashing a paycheck of the New York Times uh, by pretending that there is no such thing as a political party. There's no such thing as Republicans that the last 30, 40, 50 years of Republican history has never happened. This is just a thing that happened. And on the one side, you have partisans and, and congressional leaders who need to become more reasonable in a bipartisan way. And that's what we're talking about when we put out the bolo. Be, be on the lookout for both sides because this is what the next year and a half is going to look like. These people are going to reconstitute themselves like liquid metal in Terminator 2 and go right back to doing what they've always done, which is finding a, a, an excuse to pretend that both sides are equally to blame and that there's some fucking middle ground that only David Brooks and John Chait and David Frum and the rest of these assholes occupy. And everyone else is inferior and morally suspect because they don't agree 
that the center is the place you want to be. Well, the center is right. now in the Democratic Party. That's where the center is. So if you want to be a member of the center, if you want to be a part of the conversation, <laughs> Bernie Sanders, then you should really join the Democratic Party. If you want to participate in Democratic politics, if you want to be in the Democratic primary, if you want to be considered a part of the Democratic conversation among Democratic candidates, you really should join the group. If you don't want to be part of the Democratic Party, then don't. Go someplace else. Go form a third party. Of course, that will take down both parties and succeed in getting Donald Trump reelected. And is that really what Which you want? Which you might do anyway. Yeah. You know. Anyway, are we approaching an anniversary, Blue Gal? Next week is our nine-year anniversary. Nine-year anniversary. Not wedding anniversary, though. No, nine-year podcast anniversary. Wow. Wow. That's a lot of podcasts. We've been we've been podcasting longer than we've been married. Yes, we have. So, yeah, you yeah. know, we were we were kind of liked each other when we started we podcasting, did. but we weren't married. We used that as an excuse to sort of, you know, flirt with each other, hang out. Flirt with each other a little bit. And we still do, as a matter of fact. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you decided to make an honest podcast. I did. I did. I put a um, well ring network. Put a ring on on that. Yeah, he did. He did a lovely ring. Uh, It's a blue glass. Yes. Ring. Yes. Drift glass. Um, Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Chris Hayes. Yeah, please. Chris Hayes has a New Year's resolution, and have you noticed, everybody, that this year seems particularly intense? To me, it seems particularly intense out there. For New Year's resolutions and uh, improvement and cleaning out your closet, there's this Netflix thing on uh, KonMari, the whole empty out your entire closet and only keep things which spark joy. There's this whole thing going on. Great. Anyway, yeah, right. I've done that so many times. I've purged my closet so many times. I tried to start again yesterday. I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) I've only got a few clothes in here. Does this pair of socks really spark joy? No, but I keep my feet warm. Okay, I'll keep them. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, So Chris Hayes, and I think it's just we want renewal so badly this year. You know, we want this nightmare to end. So we're willing it to happen by writing in our journal every day for 10 minutes. I understand that. uh, But don't be um, hard on yourself and make unrealistic uh, New Year's resolutions to try to make Trump go away because Trump's going to go away on his own. Yeah. We're going to make that happen. Yeah. Um, Chris Hayes had a New Year's resolution, and it was in response to Elizabeth Warren uh, announcing, you know, that she started a committee to run for president. And he said, and I've got the transcript in front of me. You've heard a lot of by now standard punditizing about what it all means with various hot takes about whether she can avoid being pinned as unlikable or whether her drinking a beer in her kitchen was sufficiently authentic yes or whether because she didn't run in 2016 she's missed her moment now as someone in the business of covering and analyzing american politics i am genuinely sympathetic to the ways in which the insatiable demands for content mean a fair optics and electability what have you But I want to offer some advice to you, the viewer and voter, and really out loud to myself as a kind of New Year's resolution. Ignore that nonsense. Seriously, 2016 represented the political media industrial complex addicted to the spectacle and personal drama. And it is our job, all of our jobs, to do better this time around. Uh And I really felt as though 10 Grain's response to that was the answer. Yeah. It's already 2016. It, yeah, we're already there. It's all, we're already there. Yeah. We're already doing this likability nonsense. And, uh, you know, Fox News openly has Elizabeth, quote, Pocahontas, unquote, Warren yeah. in their Chiron. Yeah. That's what they call her. So, uh, which is racist. Yeah. That's just flat out white nationalist, racist, Fox News, that's what they are. And you have President, you know, Trash Hole um, right. tweeting Elizabeth Warren one two, 220th or two, one yeah. 2020th because he's a racist asshole. And the people who watch Fox News are racist assholes. And it's time we started talking openly about the fact that these people are trash and they're always going right. to be trash. And if you pander to them, you're telling them it's okay to be trash. It's okay to be a shitty racist as long as you buy my dick pill. Well, and that's where why going after the advertisers on Fox is now okay and actually necessary. Yeah, it is. Because Brilliant. it's the future of our country that's at stake. Uh-huh. And, you know, Jenny Craig is advertising on Tucker Carlson. Yep. And that's that's where they're at. And Jenny's so, dead to me. No, 
They're dead to me. Well, and I've never been on Jenny Craig, but I can tell you I'm their core audience. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the pe- person they want to reach. They're not going to reach me. Uh, they're not going to reach women like me of my age group and weight and concerns at all uh, by advertising on Tucker Carlson. Well, so, Tucker Carlson, who believes that women are the problem. Women are the problem. This week, really, yeah, and just leading to alcoholism and crime with men because they're earning too much money. Right. Yes. Uh, but Lawrence O'Donnell, earlier than Chris Hayes, Chris Hayes uh-huh. actually said, you know, we're not going to discuss with – I'm going to interview candidates. We're not going to discuss polling, campaign viability, or drama between candidates. We're going to discuss issues. And that's his – he has set that standard when he interviewed Julian Castro, who has also set up a committee. It's not – Elizabeth Warren is not the first. So I'm not endorsing anybody. Uh, during the primaries. I'm going to just stay quiet and vote for the person I'm going to vote for. I'm endorsing the Democratic candidate. The Democratic nominee for president. Absolutely. I I would like to pre-endorse. I will tell you, I expect Junior Dude to go to work for a candidate in Iowa. And if he allows me to do so, I will let you know who that candidate is. It won't be Donald Trump. No. No, (laughs) I can tell you. And it'll be a battle of ideas. Um, yeah, I would yeah. also in in uh, in the same spirit as Mr. Hayes and uh, Mr. O'Donnell, I'd like to uh, offer a suggestion that among our media friends, um, all the people who are from Howie Kurtz uh, all the way on down, please stop asking rhetorical fucking questions on Twitter. Yeah. Why does yeah. Rick Santorum get a job on CNN? Ask. Well, I don't know, man. I'm sitting in a cornfield in the middle of Illinois. You actually work in the fucking medium. You could answer this question tomorrow. I have the feeling that the uh, the answer has to do with the person who runs CNN, who you probably have uh, their phone number. Why don't you get on the phone and ask them? And then well, do and, the. And again, this is the third time we've mentioned Ten Grain, but Ten yeah. Grain blames Jeff Zucker for just about everything. Yeah. You, well, know, and, you know, in terms of why we're at 2016 again. He's, yeah. he's awfully close to being 100 percent right. Mm-hmm. Blow in a call to Jeff Zucker there, there, Lawrence. Give him a call on the weekend. Say, hey, Jeff, why are these lying assholes all over your network? And Jeff Zucker is going to say, I don't know, Lawrence. How come you guys still employ Hugh Hewitt? And that'll be the end of that conversation because everyone does it. Um, it's it's a horrible, it's a stain on your profession. It's an embarrassment. It it guts your credibility that you can't bring yourself to say bad things about your own network when they're clearly doing things that you hate, that you value your paycheck and your position more than pointing out the problem that you have already said is the problem. So it really does cut into your credibility. You don't do the horoscopes or the crossword puzzles at MSNBC. You talk about political commentary, and you have very clear opinions about people in the media who shouldn't be there. Now, when one of them, those people is literally sitting down the hall from you, it really makes you look bad or owned. You look, you look like corporate property if you can't at least hint that you understand that this is a problem inside your perimeter. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's the freedom so, we have. As I a- applaud I applaud Chris Hayes yeah. uh, for his New Year's resolution, and I applaud Lawrence O'Donnell for the questions he will not ask on his show. Yeah. Uh, it does come down, however, if we're talking about candidates uh, who agree on so many things, yeah. if we all agree on Medicare for all, if we all agree that the EPA needs to be strengthened, not weakened, if we all agree on climate change as a top priority, et cetera. On and protection on and on. Bureau, right down the list. Yep. Yep. Then it comes down to viability. It comes down to personality. It comes mm-hmm. down to who do you want to see leading the country and, and having the voice of the White House. Who can get this shit done? Really? Who can get this shit done? Who can provide that kind of leadership? Mm-hmm. And that does come down to personality and that does come down to an it factor that can't be quantified. And uh, I, the one point in uh, Elizabeth Warren's interview with Rachel Maddow that where I just about screamed at the TV was when she said, this is not about me. And I went, well, who is it about? You know, she she was asked actually point blank. She said, I'm one of your constituents. Uh, Rachel Maddow said, I'm one of your constituents in Massachusetts. I live in Massachusetts. You're my senator. If you live to be 300, I believe you would be reelected as my senator 
and until you decided you didn't want to be my senator right. anymore. I agree. Absolutely. I completely what, agree. What and he and as senator, you could be the liberal lion of the Senate. You've said this too, Drift Glass, but she yep. actually used the word lion, li- liberal lion of the Senate, mm-hmm. and lead the Senate uh, to reflect your values for the rest of your life, literally. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, why why take the risk? Why go ahead and run for president at this point? Yeah, a good question. And her answer was, "It's not about me." Well, it is about it you. Literally, <laughs> is it literally is about you? I, that. That yeah. also puts me in mind of, of people who who desperately want to be bipartisan, Cory Booker. And, yeah, and yeah. Say, this isn't about left and right. Yes, it is. Yes, it, yes, it is. literally is. So quit saying this is about right and wrong. Yeah, and if all the people on the right are wrong, then it, it does come down to left and right. It really does. And if you can't say that, if you're afraid, if you're a U.S. senator, if you're an elected official, in the Democratic Party, and you can't say my side is right and their side is wrong, and that's just the way it is right now, then I don't want you as president. I don't want you anywhere near the White House. I want you in the Senate. I want you as one vote among 100. That's great. But I absolutely do not want you as president. Because if you don't understand that the the main problem facing this country, the, the nexus through which all other problems run, is the fact that one of our two major political parties is fucking insane. And you I'm have sick. to yeah. fix that. You have to yep. break them on the wheel of history. You have to bury them. You have to get rid of them. You have to make sure they, they have no power at all and roll over them. If you don't get that, you have no business being president because you don't well, understand. This is my real concern about Beto O'Rourke as yeah. well, yeah. which is he says all the right things and onward and upward. And he's got that Obama charm and he's sure. going to. You know, no red America, blue America. We're the United States of America. Let's all work together. Great. You're going to get there and Mitch McConnell's going to be majority leader of the Senate. You have to end him. Right. You right. can't be uh, kumbaya no. with Mitch McConnell. It doesn't work. When, when I was talking to the late, great Harlan Ellison on the phone, he and I he was actually. He's not a nice person. No, he was not. He was a mean. He was a mean. He was nice to me. Yes. Uh, very nice to me, but I, th- he, he's is, very supportive of of young, uh, unpublished science fiction writers. He was supportive of them, supportive of writers in general. Mm-hmm. But he could be a nasty little man as well. He absolutely could be. Um, and and for about a year, he and I chatted on the phone, not continuously, but he'd call and I'd talk to him and I'd call him occasionally, and we swap letters, and it was it was incredibly rewarding. Mm-hmm. Um. And I sent him graphics I'd done of him, and he thought they were delightful, and it was great. But one of the critiques – I was his guy in Chicago. But one mm-hmm. of the critiques he had of Barack Obama, he says he's just too nice. Yeah. He's just too nice. too nice a guy. We need a mean, you know, knife-wielding motherfucker in there to take these people down. He doesn't have it in him to be that guy, and that's just tragic because he's a smart guy. He's great in lots of different ways, but he doesn't have the, 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 the gut-punching street sense – to, to really take it to these people and hurt them and take them down. And I, he was right. He was right. That was the, you know, the, 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 of all the many things that Barack Obama should be celebrated for, he didn't have the um, go for the jugular instinct um, that he needed to really fight against the people who, ha- who are destroying this country. And right. we cannot make that mistake a second time. Well, especially since, as a colleague pointed out to me today, Trump's going to cheat. Of course he is. Trump is going to cheat in this election. And all of his all of his people are going to scream bloody murder every time anything goes any way other than he said it should. Right. And half the media will be be on his side or be too terrified of being having their houses egged by Nazis to to do anything but go right up the middle, play at both sides. And this time we can't allow that to happen, which means we got to be louder this time. We got to be more insulting this time. We have to be more blunt this time. Mm-hmm. Um and we have to use language, which is basically the weapon of the podcaster, the weapon of the blogger, the weapon of satirists, the weapon of politicians, the weapon of priests. Um, right and down the there. weapon of congresswomen, it turns out. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> we, one thing we can be grateful for is that we are looking forward to Russiagate summer. Yes, we are. And so it's not going to be a summer of empty Trump podium no. like it was in 2015. Nope. It's not going to be a summer of, you know morning joe having donald trump phone in and talk to them i'm on the shitter uh, let's talk about race yeah okay no what do you think? no 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 that's oh. there's going to be too much to cover you know what else and is gonna happen this summer what there's gonna be a new podcast launched i've understand 
I well, I don't know if it's gonna happen in the summer. We're gonna figure this out. Right. But we have had a breakthrough in terms of how to put science fiction university on the air. Yes. And I'm grateful that uh, Drift Glass has been having uh, me listen to some other podcasts. Mm-hmm. We've been listening to Slow Burn. We listened to Bagman. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I started listening to Slow Burn with you, because we have car trips to pick up kids <laughs> and take yes, kids to college and so forth. And listening to I, the professional left over and over again does get a no, little bit after a while. That. We didn't do that at all. No. no. Uh, it occurred to me that we could do Science Fiction University as a seven-episode podcast. Yes. Yes, we could. And that could be our semester, right? Or our mm-hmm. college year, or however we want to put it. Do a seven-episode, one-off thing of a semester of Science Fiction University. Mm-hmm. Put those shows in the can and release them one a week. Yeah. And then see how the support for that goes, whether people like it or not, whether people support it or not, because there is a financial component to doing that much work. Yes, but there is. There certainly is. It uh, Putting that together for seven episodes and then releasing it seems doable. Yeah. Whereas doing a second podcast that goes 52 weeks a year, no. I was not up for that. So, or, or bolting on 12 minutes or 15 minutes of this one. Yeah, um, we're, we're, we're kind of realizing that that doesn't quite work. So we are now working on show notes for seven episodes where we're going to discuss a classic work of science fiction and also a science fiction movie. Right. That are, that uh, we're working on the show way, notes for that. That are in some way related. It is and not yeah, going to be. And they a, will have a theme, right? Yeah. There will, each show will have a theme. It will probably not be the movie version of the book or vice versa. They'll, no, but, no, we're not going to do that. Right. No. Right, because we want to do something thematic that sort of gets people mm-hmm. thinking about things and thinking about books and movies as, oh, this sort of reflects an idea. Right. It'll be writerly, I'm afraid. It'll and be writerly. This is this is how this is how character development is working. This is what the plot is. This is what the main themes. This is how the author is constructing the narrative. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm really jazzed. I, and I think there'll be some political angles to it as well. You know, sometimes to, uh, science fiction is used as a subterfuge to see? talk about social issues like the entire history of the Twilight Zone, for example. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, we're we're working on it. We've got uh, sciencefictionuniversity at gmail.com yeah. as an email address. So we're there. We're already there. It's we've halfway got done. A Twitter. We've got a Twitter. Uh-huh. I, I forget what our what is our Twitter. Science they fiction. wanted it to have a number in it, and I said no. No. So our email address is going to be sciencefictionuniversity at gmail.com, which is the only thing I could find that was not used yet <laughs> that <laughs> had science fiction and university in it. And then at science fiction U, the letter U, mm-hmm. is our Twitter handle. Cool. And we I, have I we have a way. website, but well, it's not up yet, so don't worry about it. It's not up yet. ScienceFictionUniversity dot com. I bought that. So get off our backs, people! Come on, <laughs> we're working here. ScienceFictionUniversity dot com will exist, and we own it, so that's yes. good. Yes. Uh, but other than that, yeah, we're getting there. We're going to get there, and we've got some show notes that we've been working on. So I, I was thinking of maybe soliciting a, a dear friend of mine. Uh, whose husband collects science fiction cover art yeah. to see if we can have permission maybe to use some of the cover art. Oh, for some cool. Of our, our, you know, yeah. stuff. Oh, well, that sounds like a great idea. On with the news roundup. I'm just going to do a few. It, it was, it, you know, it was the time between Christmas and New Year, so not a great deal happened. I'm sure it happened in the world. But, for example, Donald Trump, uh, after announcing that there would be a 2.1% across-the-board pay raise for federal workers, Trump issued an executive order freezing federal workers' pay. So he didn't just kick them out of work. He froze their pay because he's an asshole. Well, and um, also the uh, shutdown allowed the pay freeze to be suspended so that Donald Trump's cabinet and vice president all got a $10,000 pay raise. Yeah. And uh, uh, fortunately for, um, I guess, for uh, the vice president, he has a sense of optics and said he was going to turn his down, his pay raise down. Yeah. But uh, um, he doesn't have a sense of optics when it comes to being a t- complete toady at cabinet meetings. So no, no. Well, and over the like, for example, over the last week, literally everything Donald Trump said was wrong or a lie or nuts, including and and but. Yeah. And he enjoys around a ninety three percent approval rating with the Republican base, yeah. and that really is the sort of the snapshot of what's wrong with this country right here. Yeah. 
Um, uh, in the good news area, uh, Nancy Pelosi suggested it's time for an open discussion as to whether or not Donald Trump can be indicted by Robert Mueller while he's still in office. I couldn't agree more. That's right. Um, Democrats plan to ask for 10 years of tax returns for presidential candidates in their first piece of legislation in 2019, which is delightful. Yeah, I want to hear the opposite side of that argument. Yes, yes. And also there's Why a don't... there's a uh, a move to uh, abolish the Electoral College, which I think is a good yeah. idea. Yes. Um, just FYI, again, this is, this is not a comprehensive list. You, there, those exist everywhere else. Uh, shortly before his inauguration, Donald Trump told Sean Hannity – that he would, quote, balance the budget very quickly, I think over a five-year period. And I don't know, maybe I could even surprise you. And the national debt is now $2 trillion higher since the day Donald Trump took office. FYI. Uh, he's trying to roll back anti-discrimination rules. Uh, his Justice Department is figuring out whether they can uh, haul Ryan Zinke up on charges, which I think is a wonderful thing. But this was the week that Donald Trump tried to convince people on Twitter that the Obamas had a 10-foot wall around their house in D.C. where people could go out in the street and look at it and say, no, there's no wall here. Why are you saying shit like this? Because he's a liar, and, and liars do things like this. Um, his Christmas or his New Year's message was a happy New Year for the – even to the haters and the fake news media – and you urge everyone to calm down and enjoy the ride, baby, because that's 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 how we roll. Um, and one more, just to sort of wrap this all up, Donald Trump averaged 15 lies a day in the year of 2018. There you go. That's it. That's it. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Sophie. Sophie is on a sofa. Wow. And she's sleeping. She's just a little kitten. She's next to a hat that says no censorship. So we thought she was a good one for this week. Mm -hmm. You can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal and postal address information, along with Patreon, are all there at proleftpod.com. Thank you so much to everyone who donated to our GoFundMe for my medical bills. We reached our goal, and we are so excited to pay off those bills. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was amazing. Thank you all so much. Please share our show on Facebook or Twitter or other social media. And thank you for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties say happy 2016 to everyone. Right. Right. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, loving. Let's forget about the wine and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.